we're talking about the top 10 unbelievable facts about the Justice League that you didn't know. Boom, that's all we're gonna do. Number 10, the Apalexians. Superman's code against killing has been a fundamental part of his character for decades. When he does take someone's life, it's usually a big deal, like the end of the 2013 Man of Steel movie, or when he took out three Kryptonian criminals in Superman number 22. And then there's Justice League of America number 9. The story is a flashback as the team tells the insufferable Snapper Carr how they first came together fighting aliens from the planet Apalax. These aliens decided to come to Earth as a battleground for a war of succession to spare their own planet the damage, which is kind of rude. In the story, Superman is fighting an Apalexian that is composed of diamond. So, of course, Superman reverses his old trick of squeezing coal into diamonds by instead rubbing the alien's diamond body until it turns into coal and passed into the afterlife. When Snapper Carr asks how that's even possible, Superman quips that he quote, rubbed the diamond creature the wrong way. That's messed up. That's really messed up. Man. Number nine, society is so 1940. In the lead up to deciding to create a new superhero team, DC had created successful new versions of Golden Age heroes like Hawkman, Green Lantern, and Flash. This meant that a new version of the Golden Age Justice Society of America was a logical next step. But unlike the heroes, the name had to change. Julius Schwartz spoke about the use of the word society, saying, quote, to me, society meant something you found on Park Avenue. In The Amazing World of Comics number 14, he continued, quote, I felt that league was a stronger word, one that readers could identify with because of baseball leagues. And that was the rationale that led to the Justice League of America. After beating the Appalachians in the origin story, the heroes discuss forming a, quote, club or society before Flash sums up their mission statement as forming a, quote, league against evil. Number eight. Adam's Chair. In Justice League of America number 14, the JLA unanimously votes for the six inch high crime fighting Adam to be the newest member. The JLA return to their HQ after a battle with a villainous Mr. Memory, and the Adam attends his first ever JLA meeting. At that very meeting, he discovers that while everyone else, who is normal sized, has a chair, he does too. A tiny itty bitty little chair down on the floor, forcing him to make eye contact with everyone's ankles. It is absolutely hilarious, but of course, the Adam is kind of bummed, understandably, until someone tells him to press the button on the arm of the chair, and surprise, the chair is designed to fly up until Adam's at face level with the rest of the team. He kept this little flying chair for a hot minute, and it's adorable. Number seven, heroes versus writers? One of the wilder concepts of DC's original multiverse was the real world, which was just another universe named Earth Prime. The Flash discovers this in Flash number 166 when he stumbled into Earth Prime and turned to the employees of DC Comics as the only ones who'd believe his story. Julius Schwartz helped him return home, but the machine Flash used to get here stayed at the DC offices. Several years later, DC writers Carrie Bates and Elliot Magan discover the machine still has enough power left to send Magan to Earth 1, the JLA's home, and Bates to Earth 2, the JLA's SA's home. The Criminal Injustice Society took advantage of this by turning Bates into a supervillain. Combining his new powers with his plotting ability, Bates single-handedly took down the Justice Society of America, then went after the JLA. He did well until Magan shattered his confidence with a few well-placed insults about Bates's writing. The JLA won, the JSA got better, and Magan and the depowered Bates returned back home. I kind of think a writer has a huge home field advantage against the heroes, it kind of feels a little unfair, but hey, that's the plot, I guess. Number six, first villain. Despite how ridiculous the idea of a massive starfish looking alien that can control minds is, Starro the Conqueror is still one of the Justice League's earliest and most dangerous foes. All the way back in the Brave and the Bold issue 28 from 1960, that's our first ever introduction to Starro. This was before he used starfish facehuggers to control minds, and instead he would use a telepathic beam to control huge scores of people. When Starro did this to a town of people using 
using one of his deputies, The Flash happened to take note of the fact that one kid, Snapper Carr, possibly the most annoying kid to grace the pages of comics, was immune to the effects of Starro's mental control. But it was a mystery as to why. But it turned out that Snapper was covered in calcium oxide lime from when he was working on the lawn earlier in the day. Lime, used by oyster men to fight starfish off of their oysters, also happens to block the powers of Starro, curiously enough. And so, Green Lantern grabs a bunch of barrels of the stuff from a nearby farm, and the Flash grabs bags and bags of it from a chemical warehouse, and the team proceed to absolutely cover Starro in the stuff, imprisoning the Conqueror in an unbreakable shell of lime. As it says in the comic, a living statue of lime. Damn. Starro would make several more appearances over the years, during which he would take over both New York and London, fight the Avengers, enslave galaxies, and in one alternate future, conquer the entire universe. And he's a starfish. Weird. Number five, Aquaman disbanded the team. In 1984, the JLA went through its biggest shift when Aquaman threw a hissy fit and kicked out all the coolest characters, probably because he was the least cool. After most of the original members failed to help fend off another alien invasion, Aquaman makes the call to dissolve the League and rewrite its charter. The new rules decreed that only heroes who could devote their full time to the JLA could be admitted as members. What was left was an entirely new and stupid Justice League consisting of Aquaman, Martian Manhunter, who is awesome, Zaytana, who is also awesome, Elongated Man, who is also awesome, and a crop of teenage heroes no one cared about named Vibe, Steel, not the Superman Steel, Vixen, and Gypsy. Those last two were the first non-white heroes to be on the team way past the time that Marvel did it. Aquaman then moved the team to Detroit. This was DC's effort to try and make its offerings seem more hip and contend with Marvel's youthful X-Men, so for some reason, we got a lot of scenes involving breakdancing. But surprisingly, even with breakdancing, it was not a success. Boo. Number four, Snapper. Lucas Snapper Carr is quite possibly the most annoying team mascot I have ever seen. Appearing for the first time when the League faced off against Starro, like we just talked about, Snapper Carr is characterized by what DC Comics thought would help their comics relate to the youth. He has a quote, youthful exuberance, incessantly snaps his fingers at literally everything, and has a tendency to inject really groan-worthy humor into serious situations. Sure, his intentions are usually good-natured, but Snapper Carr has earned a reputation among fans as extremely annoying due to his penchant for making seemingly out of place jokes and remarks even in moments of high tension. Kind of like watching a Marvel movie. His incessant snapping and habit of addressing his peers with nicknames and really out of touch ones like Daddy-O came across as overly casual or inappropriate, undermining the gravity of certain situations. His presence does sometimes provide moments of comedic relief, and he remains a distinctive figure in the DC Universe, but like, only because we all roll our eyes when we see him, for better or worse. Number three, they created the Fantastic Four. Right from the start, the Justice League of America raked in the cash for DC Comics. All that money rolling in caught the eye of their competitors, and specifically, publisher Martin Goodman and his Timely Comics, the predecessor to Marvel Comics. Goodman ordered his chief writer, a guy by the name of uh, Stan Lee, I think, to follow their example and come up with their own superhero team. Lee teamed up with artist Jack Kirby, and together the two fused minds and pen to create Marvel's first family. Fantastic Four number one was created, a moment that is considered the birth of modern Marvel Comics. The monumental success of that series led to the creation of a bunch of other heroes, including Iron Man, Thor, and the Incredible Hulk, which in turn, after a delay in the printing of Daredevil number one, Stan Lee doubled down on the Justice League's winning formula and put those characters together to create the Avengers. Number two, Black Canary. Black Canary has a very weird time in DC Comics and in the Justice League specifically. For starters, the character was created in 1947, so by 1983, DC was having trouble explaining why she still looked to be in her early 20s. To fix that, in Justice League of America number 220, DC revealed that the then current Black Canary was actually, get this, the daughter of the original and was kept in unconscious stasis due to her uncontrollable sonic scream while she grew up. And she just had her no longer with us mother's memories downloaded into her blank brain. 
as you can imagine, DC canned that idea pretty soon after and would rather you just forget it happened altogether. But then in 1988, Astoria established Black Canary as a founding member of the Justice League instead of Wonder Woman, which was quite possibly one of the weirdest choices DC could have made. No hit on Black Canary, but instead of Wonder Woman? I don't know what you're thinking. Uh, and finally, in at number one, it's an Oreo addiction. Martian Manhunter is actually addicted to a brand of cookies in the DC universe called Chocos, which are similar to Oreos, and honestly, yeah, I totally understand this. He first acquires a taste for the delectable cookie when he isn't working on monitor duty. Basically, anytime he isn't working, he's eating from a bag of Chocos and becomes something of a joke to his fellow Justice League members. Booster Gold and Blue Beetle specifically decide to play a joke on the Martian, so they take his remaining supply of Chocos and purchase the entire stock of Chocos from every retailer in the city. Which is nuts. When John discovers his Chocos are missing, he freaks the heck out and has a massive super tantrum. When he does, his shape shifting abilities go into overdrive and he hulks out and goes berserk. He tears through the city looking for Chocos and as he does, his intellect declines. He becomes so brutish and damaging, Booster Gold and Blue Beetle decide they have to lure him to a warehouse to calm him down with their stash of cookies. It's eventually revealed that Chocos contain a chemical that causes a narcotic-like response in Martians. Eventually, however, Martian Manhunter figures out a way to exercise the dependency from Chacos. And that's all I got. Thank you guys so much for watching here on Top 10 Nerd. I'm Adam Andrews, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace out.